We're extremely uh, fortunate to have Professor Tim Spector as our speaker for this evening. Uh, professor Spector is a medically qualified professor of epidemiology and director of the Twins UK Registry at King's College London. His current work focuses on the microbiome and nutrition. He is co-founder of Zoe, a personalized nutrition company which runs the world's largest nutrition study, Zoe Predict, and has created a commercial at-home kit for personalized nutrition. He's also the lead researcher behind the world's biggest citizen uh, science health project, the Zoe Health Study, formerly known as the Zoe COVID Study, which provided essential data in response to the pandemic. He was awarded an OBE for this work. Having published more than 900 research articles, he is ranked in the top 100 of the world's most cited scientists by Google. He is the author of four popular science books, including The Diet Myth, Spoon Fed, and most recently, Food for Life, a Sunday Times bestseller. Uh, he makes regular appearances on social and ma mainstream media. So again, um, many thanks indeed uh, for uh, giving us uh, your time this evening, uh, Tim, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Great pleasure to be here. Thanks, James, for the introduction. And uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, let's uh, get on with it. Um, uh, so hopefully you can all uh, see this technology that I've forgotten about since COVID. I used it a lot. And it's amazing how quickly we forgot that we did everything remotely back then. Uh, yes, we can see your slides clearly, Tim. Great. Um, so I'm going to talk about personalized nutrition and, and where it's all heading. And it, a bit of it is about my journey uh, along the way. Now, um, I'm trying to see. Oh, it's not moving down. That's for some reason. Um, That's it. OK. Um, so for 30 years, I've been studying twins at uh, St. Thomas's Hospital and King's College London. And 15,000 twins have been following. And most of that time, it's been super exciting, learning the difference between nature and nurture, comparing identical twins with non-identical twins. And we learned a lot. But it's really the, the last uh, 12 to 15 years, I've been much more interested in why identical twins differ, why, why they die at different uh, times, they get different diseases, get different cancers, when they're actually genetic clones and they should be really getting the same, they have the same environment, they live in the same house for 20 odd years, and yet they get different diseases. So this fascinated me and really drove the direction of, of where I was in my research. And it was around the same time as I was making some discoveries in these twins that I was on a, a skiing holiday, oops, uh, looks like the, um, a skiing holiday, and uh, I got ill at the top, and it turned out that I had um, developed double vision because I had a micro clot in my, in my brain that went to my eye and it was a scary moment for a few months uh, as my blood pressure went right up and I thought I had all kinds of diseases. And that made me thinking about my own health and the fact my father had died uh, suddenly at age 57 of a heart attack out of the blue and I wasn't far off that. So I started being rather selfish and thinking about, oh gosh, it's all very well doing this epidemiology, doing this genetics, but what's the individual advice I can get to, to keep me alive for longer? You know, what lifestyle advice? And of course, most doctors, unfortunately, are not taught anything about lifestyle advice. We, we're taught all about medicines and investigations, but virtually nothing about what is the best diet or um, the best uh, exercise regime. And so I decided to do something about this uh, for these selfish reasons. And and spend some time, write a book on it, and get really stuck into the internet. And 
when I did, um, I found that we were seeing things that, you know, like messages such as count these calories, go for low sugar alternatives, artificial sweeteners, use low fat foods, eat starchy foods, never skip a meal, eat little and often, and exercise is the best way to lose weight. And remember one diet fits all. And after about six months of work, I realized that all of these things are complete rubbish. And there's no scientific evidence behind them at all. They're just dogma that's uh, traded out there for reasons that are a bit obscure. So this really drove me to uh, do something about it and really get out into the public domain more and try and make a difference because we're in the middle of the biggest obesity epidemic. Uh, we are the, the fattest nation in Europe and we have probably the worst diets and we're getting probably the worst advice as well. So as I, I started to think about this, I, I, I got one of the early continuous glucose monitors and put that on my arm these were used in uh, type 1 diabetes, but it was clear they, they could be used for many other purposes as well. And when I did that, this glucose monitor, which gives you a readout onto your phone, told me that my hospital meal uh, that I was getting at, at St. Thomas's, um, you know, I might have my breakfast of orange juice and a croissant or a so-called healthy muesli and uh, at lunch, a nice brown, healthy looking tuna sandwich was well a worse thing and gave me huge sugar spikes. So I realized that wasn't good uh, because I knew we knew at that time from about 2015 that sugar spikes were associated with increased diabetes and obesity. And uh, I realized that might have been why I've been gaining about a kilo in weight for 10 years. And uh, what I thought was muscle was actually just fat. Now, why are these sugar spikes important? They're actually as, as important as, our, as fat spikes, uh, triglycerides in our blood after eating meals. When they hang around too long, they cause something called inflammation, which is really an irritation of the immune system that is, is like a stress to the body. And it's a normal immune reaction to infections, et cetera, but normally it should just die down again. Whereas uh, it's like you've got these burning embers all the time in your body. And we now know that this is one of the major reasons that we get many of the Western disease we, do, we see today. And it's, it is possible to reduce these, these stresses on our body if we cut out these excessive sugar spikes and um, fat spikes in our blood. And during this experimentation, I, I was uh, taking, using these glucose monitors in the early days, I was did an experiment with some colleagues where we ate these sugary fatty muffins every four hours as the only, only meal for 24 hours. And you can see my blood spikes there. What you don't see is how unwell I felt. My brain was a real mess. I was like in a brain fog all the time and I couldn't concentrate on my work. And I suddenly realized this link between what we're eating and what's going on in your brain, which had been rarely discussed at that time. Now, I think what we've failed to realize is that why we've got nutrition so wrong is we've, treat, we've dumbed it all down. And we need to realize that our, our microbes and ourselves are incredibly complicated. In food, they're not just the three macronutrients of fats, sugars, and protein. We're actually made up, food is made up of about 50,000 plus chemicals. And we also have these huge amounts of complexity of gut microbes in our body, but also giving us this complexity. So, it's all these chemical reactions that are, uh, we haven't at all discussed. And 
the missing piece of the puzzle, why we've got so much nutrition advice wrong is because we haven't known about this new part of our body, which is the microbiome, which is this community of all these microbes, um, which are essentially a virtual organ. I call them a, a collection of mini pharmacies, all producing fantastic chemicals that our body can't produce itself. But many of them are vitamins or key neurochemicals uh, stopping us getting depressed or anxious and also breaking down our food. But probably their key use is our controlling our immune system because the immune system is absolutely key to fighting infections, stopping allergies, um, preventing cancers and aging. I'm only just scraping the surface of what these guys do. So the, and it turns out that the, the one thing that was different in the identical twins that I found was that they had very different microbiomes. It's the only thing I found in 30 years of investigation that was really different about uh, identical twins. And at the same time, we've been talking about food in terms of these macronutrients, we're getting that wrong. We thought about fiber as just a sort of roughage, a sort of structural thing. We didn't think of fiber as food for microbes, which is what it is. And there are hundreds of different types of fibers. But there's also something else in food which we've ignored, which is these defense chemicals in foods, which make them super healthy because they are like rocket fuel for our gut microbes. And they're contained in things like nuts and seeds. They're contained in uh, things like coffee, olive oil, dark chocolate, um, berries, and even in red wine. And most of these uh, things were thought of as bad for us because they had things like high fats or caffeine or uh, other byproducts in them. And it turns out now the latest epidemiology, which is study of population, show they actually are in moderation are healthy for us. So coffee is actually a, I would classify it as a health drink. It reduces your risk of heart disease by about 30%, unlike orange juice, which probably increases your risk of heart disease by 30%. Now, why does this matter? What's the relationship between a healthy gut and a, an unhealthy gut? Well, most of the common diseases that we see nowadays and, and problems are related to uh, poor gut health, which means a lack of um, diversity in your microbes, diff lack of species. And we know that compared to 50 years ago, we've lost perhaps 40% of our gut microbes. If you compare to Af African tribes and other developing countries, we have far fewer species than we used to. And so they're being killed off. And it turns out that when you have a lack of species, like you know, an Arizona backyard, you're much more prone to infections like weeds taking over. Whereas if you think of your gut as like a garden, you really want to encourage as many different species in there, rich soil, uh, everything is not everything is used by the other plants and seeds. You can put healthy fertilizer in there, which is like more prebiotics. You can put mm. seeds in there, which are probiotics, and uh, constant watering, making sure you don't have pesticides and other nasty things in there. And if you've got that kind of gut, then you're going to be protected from all of those conditions you see above you. Now, in my first book, The Diet Myth, I, I did all kinds of experiments and I just finished doing the, the uh, French cheese diet, which consisted of uh, only eating unpasteurized French cheese uh, washed down with a glass of red wine. And it was a fantastic diet for the first 24 hours. I was gonna write a book about it and become a, a multimillionaire. But by day two, it wasn't quite so good. And by day three, I really didn't want to see cheese again. So um, I put that off that idea. My next plan was to do a study of 
what was happened to my gut microbes if I ate McDonald's every day for 10 days. And I was just about to do this when uh, another potential volunteer appeared. He was a student, he was short of cash, he loved McDonald's, and he was also my son. So he ticked all the boxes and was super keen to do, do this, all paid for by his dad as a research project. He had to eat all his meals at McDonald's. Um, and he thought this would be easy. And he phoned me up after four days and said, Dad, it's not quite as easy I think, as, you, as I thought. I'm not feeling so well now. I don't feel hungry anymore. Um, and you know, I think my studies are, are suffering. So obviously, as a concerned parent, uh, I was worried. But I said, just get on with it. We're going to publish this in the Sunday Times. It's far more important. And he did continue. And the serious note of this is that he lost around 30% uh, of his microbial species in those 10 days and he still hasn't returned to normal so uh he's uh he's considering suing me at the moment so it's a lesson for any parent out there who wants to do experiments um i was giving a talk like this in in 2017 and two guys in the audience came up to me and said uh we love what you're talking about the gut microbes potential for personalized medicine and health. Can we um, talk about getting a company together? And most companies in this, in this space are based purely on marketing. They um, just get a, a nice advisory board and lots of adverts and copy other people's work. And I said, I didn't want that. You've got to actually get some real cash, several million pounds, and we have to do some proper studies. So I thought I'd never see them again. But Three weeks later, they came back with the money, so I couldn't say no. And luckily, it was a fantastic uh, relationship with these guys um, who were not only great entrepreneurs, but they had great expertise in areas I didn't have on the Internet and, uh, and starting up companies. And we now have a, a, a company that's doing very well, has over 400 employees, and we have over 100,000 Zoe members in both the US and the UK. Now, it wouldn't have been possible where, without these technology advances. That is the, the glucose monitor, which been, has been around for about 10 years. The fact that you can at home take your own blood and put it on a piece of dry blotting paper and send it in. You've got an app that you can record everything with and uh, record mood and uh, all your results without needing paper and cumbersome stuff like that. And finally, of course, the genetic sequencing of your, your poo sample, which means you can get really good readouts of what's going on in your guts and your microbiome at a fraction of the price it was 10 years ago. So thanks to technology and big data computing, we were able to put all this together and uh, have a, a, a real go at something that would have been impossible a few years ago. Now, this slide is important because nutrition science up to, up to uh, about 2017 had basically been, usually been based around 20 students randomized to two different diets and followed for a week. And the results were always based on the mean of group one versus group two. And that's how we based all our advice. Now, What's really interesting is that the mean response in many cases in nutrition is, is meaningless because individuals respond very differently. And this is a, a graph that was just taking people uh, who are on high fat or uh, high carb diets. And what suits one person has an opposite effect on another. And we've totally failed to appreciate this personalization element to it which could be why you know, we're in this confusing state when we talk about keto diets or low fat or low carb. There isn't one diet that, that suits everybody. So we set up the uh, Zoe Predict study, uh, which was the biggest ever intervention study 
done in nutrition and we did it in super fast time at uh, King's College in London with my uh, twin team. And of the thousand people, 600 were twins. And we did all kinds of tests on them. But the, the key thing was that everyone got an identical meal at an identical time and we measured their responses. And you can see on the right, the graphs here of the blood fat levels, that's triglyceride at the top, and then the blood sugar at the bottom showed a 10 to 20 fold difference between individuals. And no one was average. Those blue and red lines are the average levels and they were um, really, uh, nobody fitted those. So that, was the aha moment that we knew that, wow, we're getting all these changes. And that means they're consistent changes between people. So the same meal does not have the same effect on everybody. We are all metabolically unique. Now, as a geneticist and someone who'd been studying twins, I'd assume that genes were really important. But it turned out that when we looked at all these twins we had in the sample, there was very little difference between them and the rest of the population. And many twins had very different responses to the same food. So this wasn't something that you could just explain away uh, because of genetics. And I think that was really uh, a bit of a shock to me, but really changed my mind about genetic determinism. But the good news is because it's not genetic, it's likely to be related to factors such as uh, your food composition, the microbiome, things that you can actually change. Uh, we wrote this up in a, um, a paper in, a, in a, one of the top journals, Nature Medicine. Uh, and we also followed it up with a, a study of actually what happening to the mi microbes uh, when you in this variation in microbes um, and how does that relate to the foods you're putting in and what uh, this told us was certain ones were predictive of how you responded to these foods and others weren't and we've now updated this with 30,000 um, samples which uh, is what you need to get real results in this field. Um, We've gone on to do a number of other studies. Um, some of you might remember during COVID, we had um, about 4 million people at one point had signed up to the Zoe app in order to uh, feed in their information and get data back on COVID. We did some huge studies involving over a million people giving their dietary data to us. And we found one of them, uh, clearly showed that the quality of the food you're eating was one of the biggest factors in how badly you responded to COVID, how serious or severe the uh, sequelae were. And that implied that if your diet was poor, that would likely to be that your gut microbiome was also very poor. And using these new techniques with apps and uh, other devices, we did a study of a million people in uh, about six weeks that would have taken us six years and probably uh, six million pounds if we'd ever got it funded to do. So I think the COVID and the apps and these new technologies are really changing the way we do studies in epidemiology. And since then, uh, as we've moved away from COVID, we've done various other studies on health. We did a big study on intermittent fasting, showing that a third of people who can do it very easily, that's fasting overnight uh, for 14 hours or more, get big benefits. And uh, we've done another study go ongoing about fermented foods. So plenty of uh, ways of doing science now using uh, mobile phones, apps, and at a huge scale. Um, now, some of the, what you get with the Zoe uh, kit is, is really three 
three key things that help our algorithm. The first is what's your blood sugar control after this standard meal, which is a cookie at the moment, it used to be a muffin, and mine's pretty dreadful, uh, which means that I'm going to respond much more uh, negatively to, say, eating a, a bagel or a croissant in the morning than my wife, who has a much better score, which is really annoying. And it underscores that, you know, even within a family, you can get some quite big differences. Now, um, my blood fat control wasn't much better, but um, I've repeated that and it, it is has got better since then. So it's about, um, I'm about average now for my age. So I've worked out that it's better for me to have high fat breakfasts than a high carb breakfasts. And certainly I've noticed when I've changed that um, I definitely have more energy and I'm less hungry uh, having switched. Uh, any good news for me is my uh, microbiome score, which uh, we look at species diversity and the ratio of good bugs to bad bugs, uh, shows me I'm in the sort of top 5%. And I've done this several times. I've, I'm, I'm trying to get towards 90%. And I have heard some people who are uh, customers who have managed to get up to about 98, a score of 98, but they're, they're pretty rare. Now, another interesting thing is when you collect hundreds of thousands of uh, these samples, you can start to find out some rather interesting things. Now, if I told any of you five years ago, you've got a parasite in your gut, you wouldn't be too happy. But it turns out that if you have blastocystis, which is a parasite that we all had as all our ancestors had, and you're perhaps one of one of 30, one in three or one in four people in the UK with it, then you're more likely to have low blood cholesterol levels, uh, low body fat, low blood pressure, and generally be much healthier. So sometimes uh, what turns out to be potentially bad with our new science tends to be good. And we what we think is this, this parasite, which is much bigger than a, a, a bacteria, is uh, actually eating some of the uh, unhealthy microbes in our gut, keeping them down. A bit like having a wolf in uh, Yellowstone Park it keeps down the predators. Uh, sorry, it keeps, so that when they removed the wolf, uh, shot all the wolves, then the uh, deer uh, proliferated, they ate all the trees, and then all the birds and insects suffered. So it, we need to be careful we don't kill off all our microbes with antibiotics and uh, bad diets. So what's the future of personalized nutrition? Um, I think I asked about this quite a lot. Um, and we are seeing the ability to not only look within people, but even at the same, same person at different times of life, I think we're going to see differences. And we looked in detail at, at women and their menopausal status. So whether they were still had high estrogen levels or not. And we saw quite big differences between uh, peri, pre and postmenopausal women in terms of uh, how they processed foods. So Clearly, um, our hormones have an effect on our, our ability to process food and protect ourselves from it. And this explains why a lot of women do gain weight around the menopause, despite not increasing the food they're eating. It's just their body isn't processing as well, and they end up with inflammation and increased stress levels. And so both age and uh, menopause have these, these effects. Um, other studies have shown that a personalized approach, um, this one by ZV was just based on blood sugar levels. It didn't use uh, uh, the full algorithms that we do, and it showed improvements. Um, there was a, an EU project that um, compared uh, rather crude personalization into, into categories, but it did uh, 
improve many of those. And a study which should be uh, out soon, it's, it's just been accepted in a, a major journal um, of about 360 individuals showed that randomized, in, this is in the US, compared to the, the standard US nutritional advice about reducing calories and eating more fruit and veg, um, there's people on the Zoe uh, plan, which was personalized, uh, lost more weight, had more energy, better sleep, better mood, and improved their triglycerides. So I think we're getting to a consensus that this is uh, a useful approach. So the personalized nutrition industry actually is perhaps bigger than many people th think. And a lot of it is in the US. We don't see much of it here, but uh, it, it's a huge player as people realize the health market is so big. So it's, it's already at around 18 billion and it's supposed to go up to about 100 billion in the next 10 years. The NIH in the US, which is the big funding agency there, have just uh, spent 170 million pounds on a huge uh, studies across America to uh, do what they call precision health. Uh, the UK is spending nothing on it, but uh, Zoe um, is doing this thanks to the fact that everyone who takes part in Zoe signs up to do research so that all their data is used uh, by us and shared with, with academics around the world. And I think we're gonna be seeing uh, much more of this. Uh, but should briefly say that because of our genetic studies, we do know that I don't think genes are the way forward. And there are many companies still promoting genes. And uh, I think they are pretty much a waste of money. The other thing we can do with um, this new approach and these scores is to start thinking about foods in different ways. So rather than, um, this is a table from my book, Food for Life, but it, I've got some of my scores in there. Um, this is my overall Zoe score, which is a combination of my fat response, my sugar response, my gut health. And these, uh, a lot of these are dairy products, which would have been given scores based purely on their fat content. And we have a completely different scoring system when you look at it uh, more based on science than tradition. And I think this is very much the way forward as we start to uh, change what we think is a good foods and bad foods. And when you go to a supermarket and you look at the, that whole range of uh, children's yogurts and dairy products, virtually all of them are most nutritionists would consider incredibly unhealthy and yet they're full of health labels. Um, just for our discussion, I'll, I thought I'd provoke a bit of that and talk about some of the foods that are, I've changed my mind on since um, writing Food for Life. The first is bread. Um, there's not many breads I can eat without giving me a big sugar spike, which makes me hungry and moody. And virtually all the supermarket breads, uh, whatever they say on the packet, generally are ultra processed. They've got emulsifiers in them. They've got uh, salt, they've got sugar, they've got uh, all kinds of stuff, even though occasionally they do have seeds and a little bit of fiber. So um, bread for most people is probably bad news. And we're, we're conned into thinking that's a health food. Uh, if you are gonna have bread, you know, know what your sh sugar levels are. You might be fine, you might not spike much, but if you do, you might better off sticking to really high fiber ones like rye or making your own so you know what's in it. Um, milk is another big contentious factor. I was, I did uh, osteoporosis clinics for uh, 30 years and I was telling women to drink lots of dairy milk uh, to help their bones. There's no evidence that's true anymore. And it doesn't, protect bones, particularly calcium is vastly overrated. And um, we know it's very bad for the planet. And this is a good example of 
uh, in Food for Life, I, I looked at food from three different angles, really health, uh, ethics, and the environment. And if I had uh, oat milk instead of cow's milk, it would be better for the planet because it uses left land and therefore is much more sustainable. But for me, it gave me a big sugar spike and so and has other uh, non-healthy things in it, including pesticides often in the oats that make it less likely to be good for me. So I think we need to be making interesting choices based on personal preference on uh, whether we want to <coughs> help the planet more or help ourselves or both. Fish. Uh, have a fantastic PR machine behind them. Everyone says uh, eating fish, and my mum did, makes you brainy. Uh, the evidence is pretty weak that it's that useful for us. There's no evidence really they're bad for you if you ignore the fact they're often full of microplastics, mercury, uh, antibiotics, and most of them come from fish farms, which are ruining the planet. Um, and if we did eat, the two portions of fish a week, everybody did, the oceans would be dry within two years. So I think we've got to be a bit careful about fish. Um, and the only sustainable ones really are the very small fish or mussels and clams, which are really good for the environment. Mushrooms are amazing, uh, not just the magic ones, uh, really good for health and there's incre increased evidence they're good for um, helping our immune systems. There's lots of evidence they help in people on cancer therapies. And uh, they actually are a source of vitamin D if you leave them under your windowsill. So we should all be having many more mushrooms. They are amazing. And um, I'll never look at the salad the same way again. Um, iceberg lettuce became famous in the UK um, last year because uh, it was noted that iceberg lettuce has lasted longer than some of our prime ministers. And most of us have an iceberg lettuce somewhere at the bottom of our fridge. When you come back from holiday, it's the only thing there. And that's the only good thing about it. It has absolutely no nutrient content whatsoever. Uh, it's just durable. And if you take proper colored, brightly colored lettuces like Rossololo or radicchio, they have a thousand times more healthy uh, polyphenols and nutrients. So everything that looks like a salad isn't always the same. My views on ultra processed food have also changed uh, quite a lot. And I, I thought it was just junk foods. Um, and I thought that uh, they had harmful effects just from the chemicals on your gut microbiome. So emulsifiers, gums, artificial sweeteners, et cetera. But some recent research confirms that ultra processed foods increase our appetite by about 25%. So we eat much more rubbish. And that's probably the main reason that um, manufacturers make so much money out of them is that we just keep overeating this cheap rubbish and keeping them in business. And this costs the taxpayer around 80 odd billion pounds a year and gives enormous profits to these companies. Now, there are lots of epidemiology studies now showing that ultra processed food eating in the, the top quartile of the population increases risk of most of our common disease by about 20 to 40 percent and that probably accounts for why we are uh, the sickest nation in Europe because we have the most percentage of ultra processed foods in our diet compared to any other country. So what next? Um, well we've got all these digital devices we need to start linking up to our health that I think are going to be very exciting. I think we're going to be doing more and more remote clinical testing. The idea you have to go to hospital or see a doctor, I think is very old fashioned. Uh, on blood drops, we can do multiple 
uh, hundreds of blood tests in the future. And I think uh, trials will be done more by citizen science than we've done before. Um, but, you know, we are going to be uh, producing continuous advice, personalized to people how to live their lives. I think hopefully change uh, the way people are scoring foods. But, you know, we've got some obstacles there ahead of us. Um, we've got a huge uh, industrial complex that uh, have budgets that can basically bribe any politician, uh, any institution that have infiltrated most of our universities. And so getting rid of their influence on us is going to be tough. We need warning labels on ultra processed foods like a dozen countries have already got. We need to start taxing it. We need to change NHS guidelines that are about 15 years out of date. Most of these bad foods have ridiculous health claims, which we need to stop. And I think we should, in every school, university, uh, government institution, prisons, um, hospitals, etc., have rules about uh, not serving more than 10% ultra processed food. And uh, I think we should all start getting a bit angry about what's being done to us uh, without our knowledge and without giving us the proper warnings to make the right choices. So five tips on a more optimistic note about how you can change, because you've been listening to my lecture now, you're fully informed. If you want to improve your gut microbes, you need 30 plants a week. That's not just 30 types of kale, that's nuts, seeds, herbs, spices, fruits, and veg. And you don't need very much of some of these spices and herbs. Regular fermented foods, uh, really important for your immune system. Eating the rainbow, so you get all those polyphenols. Resting your gut with um, fasting, so that you're not snacking late at night, you're giving your your body at least 12 to 14 hours to recover and those microbes thank you for it and of course reducing ultra processed food and increasing your intake of real whole foods um, and if you want to dive into this in in more detail my book is a sort of a to z of food uh, and is now in paperback is quite cheap and if you want to really drill into nutrition the Zoe Science and Nutrition Podcast is the top nutrition podcast in the world at the moment on, in the English language, and that's totally free. And um, all I want to leave you with is the fact that hopefully I've changed a little bit your thoughts about food and that the next time you put something into your mouth, you'll realize that with 100 trillion microbes inside there, you're never going to be eating alone again. So do think of them next time you do that. And with that, I think I'll uh, stop and uh, take any questions. Thanks very much indeed, Tim. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, many thanks for sharing those insights that you've gleaned over over many years. I'm sure it'll have uh, provoked a lot of um, questions uh, from our audience. So please, with our audience, kindly start uh, sending your questions in on the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your um, Zoom screens. Uh, Tim, if I could maybe just start off with a couple of questions for you. Um, could you just uh, may maybe indicate what role exercise might have uh, in terms of our uh, micro makeup of our microbiota? Has it any role? Does sleep have a role? Uh, what might be going on there? Um, yeah, so exercise is useless for weight loss, mm -hmm. but it's really good for your health. So it's a strange um, mix, really good for your mental health, your heart, fighting cancer, et cetera. But you know, your body's adapted to not use it as a weight loss tool. Um, it has in a few mouse models, some minor effects on our gut microbes. So when you put mice in, in treadmills, you can get them to slightly improve their gut microbes, but it, it seems to be a fairly small factor. So I think it's, its general effects of exercise seem to be on the, the rest of the body. Uh, not, it's not the main effect of how it affects microbes, certainly. Okay. Thank you for that, Tim. Uh, and um, 
it's super like, athletes don't seem to have better microbes than uh, amateur athletes. And uh, 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 what exactly do you think is going on with, with the intermittent fasting then in terms of uh, the microbiome? Uh, how, how is that exactly impacting on these bacteria or other organisms? Well, you've got to remember that the average bacteria, you know, how they live life pretty fast. So they're reproducing in a few hours um, and dying off. And so what happens when uh, at night when you're asleep is generally the a different team come out and uh, clean up the mess from the night before, from the daytime. And like the nighttime cleaners in an office and they come in and they clean up the debris, they tidy up your gut lining and they're not interested in food. They're not adaptive for that. They just clean up the mucus lining of your gut and tidy it up. And that seems to be very important for your immune system to keep that in tip top shape. And that's why um, sl probably sleep and you know eating so that you give your, your gut a rest in a real circadian rhythm is really important. So just like we need rest through sleep, so do your microbes. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. If I could just start picking up a few questions then coming in from the audience. Uh, Tim, you mentioned you don't agree that DNA plays any part in health outcome. Doesn't it give the extra information, e.g. in terms of higher vitamin D need, et cetera? So. Well, I didn't say it had no uh, effect. I, um, genes are important, but in terms of how we, re we respond to food, they're a, a quite a minor player. Um, you know, it's it still has some effect, we think around 20% for sugar, uh, but you know, less than 3% for f how we respond to fat. So, um, you know, the genes obviously do play a, a role and what our normal levels are. And so the question is about vitamin D and I've published on uh, the genetics of vitamin D. So it is controlled to some extent uh, by genes, but um, that just means that you, everyone needs slightly different levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be normal and we haven't worked that out yet so it, it sort of means that when you take blood from someone no one quite knows what's normal for that person so that's a perfectly reasonable question so uh, I'm you know I'm not saying genes have no role I'm just saying uh, compared to the microbiome and, and yep. these other things that we're looking at now our current knowledge of genes isn't good enough to predict what we should be eating. But it's a great, great question. Uh, following up on that then, uh, how do identical twins end up having uh, different microbiomes, especially in the early years when they've been brought up in the same household, the same similar diets, you'd think? Yeah, they've, they've followed a few uh, infant twins and, and non-twins in the first, first three years of life is when everything's really dynamic. So you, we all start life with no microbes and then the messy birth process, we get them through our mouth and that enables us to uh, digest breast milk. But the first three years, every time there's a minor infection, you get a complete change in your gut microbes. Every time you touch someone or you, uh, you know, the dog licks you, you're gonna get a different set of microbes. And so even identical twins, are getting different infections, getting uh, different exposures. And one might be given antibiotics, the other one not, and that will totally change them. So um, it's actually much more random than we thought. Interesting. Uh, inspiring stuff, Tim. Would you agree that the main challenge going forwards is one of messaging? How can you, we, the science community, engage with people who wouldn't usually read scientific information? I guess we could argue maybe, Tim, that um, in some ways, uh, those with the greatest need for the advice of them, that Zoe can potentially offer, are, are, are the ones least likely to be able to access it. Uh, so what can might be done for them, do you think, uh, going forwards? Well, I, there's, you know, it's interesting. I mean, my career, I mean, I, I've written hundreds of papers which maybe only a thousand people ever saw um, and read. Um, 
I did a YouTube video about what I ate for breakfast and three million people have seen it. So I think if every scientist did get out there a bit more um, and used social media and, and all these ways of, of reaching a wider audience by not overcomplicating it, we could reach many more people than we are or you know, we've been trained to do. So, um, you know, yes, not everyone is going to look at YouTube, but um, we at Zoe did a collaboration with Marks and Spencers on our gut shot. And, you know, obviously people criticize us working with the enemy, etc. But many people who went into Marks and Spencers had never heard of the term gut shot or gut health or anything. So by doing these things, we are slowly getting to people that don't read, you know, the Daily Telegraph or the Times or um, listen to podcasts. So I think it's a gradual process. Um, ultimately, I think schools are where we need to be teaching this. And yeah. I think nutrition has got to become a, a core subject because yeah. it is the most important thing we can do for our health. And it's the worst thing to be ignorant about. Yeah, I think with the fact that we've probably got quite a few six formers and potentially some uh, other health. Because, you know, we've got to stop just, you know, we abandoned, uh, you know, nutrition. You can't study nutrition at A level. Um, you can't, you know, so uh, cooking classes, which used to be much more widespread and now just, you know, how to make a cupcake or a brownie. Um, everyone should learn, you know, 10 key uh, dishes for life and this is a life skill that we're losing is it, do you think it's fair to say that we're not teaching enough about nutrition on our medical uh, degree uh, curricula as well it's yeah we but i was taught about three hours of nutrition and uh you know 40 years later that's still what they get um most doctors learn all about you know learn much more about scurvy than they do about obesity. And, you know, I've still never seen a case of scurvy. Hmm. Tim, um, you, you've definitely uh, influenced our thinking here. Uh, fantastic talk. Can you say a bit more about the research evidence on the best diet for osteoporosis? Yeah, well, I've changed my view on the best diet for osteoporosis. So I think... Um, if you have a balanced diet that you're having plenty of uh, vegetables um, with, uh, I think there is a case for having a little bit of fish as well, or they make it sustainable then, and you're getting uh, enough protein in general, which you would be if you have a, you include, include le you know, beans and legumes and lentils and uh, high protein foods like that. Uh, that's more important than eating lots of dairy. So I think we used to think it was all about pumping for yourself full of uh, cheesecake and uh, and pints of milk. We now know that's not the case. So I think it's 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 a similar you know, advice for everybody. Is you know the advice I gave on improving your gut microbes uh, should improve your your bone health. It's unfortunately milk isn't the answer, uh, and it's a good diet but it's also the importance of weight bearing exercise uh, is also equally important. And um, yeah, in addition to some, some good drugs, which reduce your risk of um, fracture. Thank you. Uh, Tim, what have you got against orange juice? Is it too much sugar? Um, I used to love orange juice. I was a, a real Tropicana fan. I used to get through gallons of it and give it to my kids. Um, it was when I best basically started seeing what happened to my blood sugar when I when I drank it. And um, it's just an unnatural way to have fruit because most of the most of the goodness, the fiber, the pith has been taken out of it. And you've got this concentrated mass. So it's like, you know, you wouldn't sit down at a meal and eat seven or eight oranges. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't do that in about 30 seconds. So your body doesn't have a chance to react to it. It's just a abnormal and most of the orange juice that we drink is uh, highly processed um it has flavor packs added to it it's often two years old it's been sitting in giant vats in spain 
um, in, in, a, in, in nitrogen tanks. Uh, you know, it's an ultra processed food that's had a fantastic PR campaign, but it's time. I think it's over and we should definitely move it away from the health shelf and, and stick it next to Coca-Cola, which, which in a way is a more honest drink. Hmm. Thank you. So, so Tim, what research is going on in other microbiomes? Someone's asking you about whether there's any research on the vaginal microbiome. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on there, which is the odd one out because of all the microbiomes, uh, a healthy uh, vaginal microbiome is one where there's very little diversity. Basically, you just want these um, lactobacillus, which keep the pH uh, perfect and have the right conditions for, for good health and fertility. Uh, and there are many studies showing that it's related to infertility and all kinds of other problems, urinary tract infections, and it's made worse by antibiotics and um, over cleanliness and you know, various creams and things like this. So um, there's quite a lot of work, particularly in the infertility space, showing that if you improve your, your microbiome there, then actually a lot happens to your health. So I think in the future, people will be able to get more easily screened for their, their microbiome there. And uh, there's also skin microbiome is another area that uh, has a lot of interest. Um, you know, can you change it with like probiotic creams? Uh, and we now know that people with eczema often have more problems if they wash too much with soap because they're getting rid of the protective microbes. So we're sort of having to unlearn a lot of stuff that we thought was the right thing to do. And we're working out that being too clean, being too sterile, using too many chemicals is generally a bad thing for these microbes, which are, you know, vast majority of them are there to help protect us. Thank you. Tim, what insights have you gained on the role of diet in causing mental health problems, but also as a treatment for mental health problems? So what... Yeah, um, great question. Um, there's there's a, a, a really large amount of data now showing that uh, people with mental health, particularly depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, to some extent, and autism spectrum disorders have disordered microbes. And some of that is due to the fact that they may not be eating well, and some of it is actually causal, and that they've done lots of animal studies to show that you can actually transmit anxiety and depression from one animal to another through their microbes. And microbes produce a lot of the brain chemicals that make people anxious or depressed or protect them from it. And there are now at least a dozen studies showing that probiotics uh, can improve uh, anxiety and depressive symptoms, as well as in removing ultra processed foods and putting a healthy gut friendly diet instead has at least as much benefit as antidepressant drugs. And we know that antidepressant drugs fail in about 30% 30, 30 of people completely. And we think that's due to the gut microbes just being, by chance, the wrong ones, and they deactivate the drug. So it's a huge uh, area of interest, and I think we're going to see much more in that space soon, particularly as we realize we haven't got many great drugs at the moment for mental health. Thank you again. Uh, how quickly can you improve your microbiome? Uh, if it's really bad in a few days, um, if you're sort of moderate, uh, it probably takes several weeks. Uh, so most of our studies, we generally see changes at about 12 weeks. But, um, you, you know, if you're a vegan and you suddenly start eating meat, you'll, you can see changes the next day or vice versa. Um, fermented food studies, they've shown effects in two weeks just by uh, having more fermented foods. So it's pretty quick. Thank you, Tim. Um, the Zoe kit is fairly expensive, uh, presumably due to the technology involved. Uh, do you worry that your research will not be applicable to the general public as it will mainly be middle class, wealthy individuals taking part? Do you think at some point the NHS might take on this type of work to help reduce the burden of disease long term? Uh, great question. Um, I think part of Zoe is to, and my books are to educate large amounts of people 
we have a free podcast. We Instagram is very popular, you know, nearly a million people following that with free recipes and advice. Um, and so I think we are exposing people, you know, to the educational side of what we're doing, which is, you know, perhaps half of what the problem is. For the other people uh, who would like the test, we'd love it to be cheaper. But, you know, like any new technology, remember when they, you know, the mobile phone came out, they were pretty expensive. People said they were only for the rich. Now everyone's got them because as technology gets broader, it gets cheaper. So it will get cheaper. You know, we are thinking of trying to bring out, look at imaginative ways of getting the price down, removing some of the complexity of the kit, making a simpler version, et cetera. So we're, we're definitely aware of that, but uh, we're, you know, we're still a loss making company. So we have to uh, keep going somehow. Yeah. Uh, are you doing any research studies with certain patient population groups, maybe diabetes, arthritis, certain cancers? And should we be factoring in more microbiome tests when analyzing therapeutic interventions? Um, well, definitely we should, including microbiome in, in all these studies now. We did a big study on cancer. Uh, it wasn't with Zoe, but with the university. Uh, people on immunotherapy for for metastatic melanoma and show that the gut the state of the gut health at the beginning of that study was the biggest um, had the biggest impact on survival at 12 months so the difference between life and death you know was which category of microbiome you were in if your gut health was good or bad so i think that's probably going to be true for many diseases uh, and interventions with drugs because at least half the drugs we commonly use interact with the gut microbes so we're going to be seeing more of that. Um, at Zoe, we can't do too much detailed uh, disease-specific work because we're not a medical device yet. We're still a, 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 what's called a health device. So we have to tread carefully. I'd love to do studies on diabetes and, and, and cancer, et cetera, but we can't explicitly do that at the moment just because we have these rather archaic rules uh, that limit limit this for the wrong reasons okay. uh, can you please tell us more how you managed to conduct the citizen science study successfully what are the main strategies you use to engage general public to donate samples and um yeah pay a, a subscription uh we had to get their trust and i think um you know we we had no idea in covid how we were going to do that but people responded to the fact that we gave them immediate feedback and that we were very transparent about our results most medical researchers traditionally have just kept the results themselves until they publish it you know three years later and we gave it back to the participants virtually immediately and i think that built up uh a lot of trust between us and that was the most crucial factor because getting four million people to give us their health data to a startup company they never heard of most people would say you're mad if you thought anyone would do that and initially when we started people some people thought it was a scam you know and they tried to shut us down the government tried to shut us down because they thought we were interfering with their their brilliant nhs app um so it was an interesting time, but I think, you know, because we were frank, we were transparent, we gave people the data back, they trusted us. And I think that's the, that's the key. You've got to show that that's what you're willing to do in order to get a very much a two way. Mm -hmm. uh, so both, both parties are benefiting. And I think that's the difference between conventional research and this new way of doing it. So they, they feel very much a part of it. Excellent. Uh, perhaps uh, we can finish off with just one or two more questions, uh, Tim, because I'm conscious of the time. Um, perhaps you could elaborate a little bit more about the role of nutrition in women and the impact of mental health at different stages, pregnancy, postpartum. I, mean, I know you alluded it to uh, a little bit of that in your talk. Y yes, well, uh, with um, women are complicated and uh, much more complicated than men. And that's why they haven't actually been studied much in nutrition. So 90% of all the studies are done on men, not women. 
uh, that's the way the funding goes, because otherwise you'd have to pick, you know, one group of women who are premenopausal, not on the pill, others on the pill, different times of cycle, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone's shied away from that. Um, we're, at Zoe, we're, we're addressing that balance. and Most of the study participants are women. And that's really why we found those, those data on the menopause, why we've worked on HRT. We find there's an interaction between diet and HRT and, um, and the gut microbiome. But these are still very early days. Um, and we're not allowed to study pregnant women, which is crazy. Um, but, you know, we'd love to do that and not exclude them from everything. So women at the moment have been excluded from most research um, through no fault of their own, because generally men are sort of saying they're being overprotect, you know, protecting them. Uh, but I think we need to start shouting and saying this isn't right. Let let people do work on, you know, uh, women more. Let's make it obligatory that we understand more. But uh, eventually we'll get big enough samples. We'll be able to do this uh, at Zoe. But at the moment, it's just that data on the menopause showing that your nutrition balance will change quite a lot uh, throughout life. And it's likely to change within your cycles as well. Thank you. Uh, so, so just a couple more questions. So what's your opinion on eating meat, uh, Tim? Uh, I eat meat once or twice a month. Uh, I make sure it's really good quality. Otherwise, it's not worth eating. Um, if you eat too much meat or you eat large amounts of processed meat, it's been shown to be bad for you. But in general, uh, the, only, the main problem with meat is it takes space on your plate away from plants. Um, and the other thing about eating meat is that it's probably the worst thing you can do for the planet. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in helping the planet as well as your health, you should be limiting your meat. And we certainly shouldn't be having it on a daily basis. But there's nothing wrong with small amounts of good quality uh, meat that hasn't been fed with antibiotics, for example. Thank you again. Uh, Tim, there's some concern about your son. Um, has his uh, microbiome yet recovered? And how fast does the microbiome respond to changes in personalized diet? Uh, well, my son seems to be the exception. Everyone else seems to be doing rather well uh, on the Zoe diet. Um, I think there is a worry that if you are on a junk food diet continuously with absolutely zero fiber, you could knock off a lot of your healthy microbes and they find it's hard to replace those if they've been totally wiped out. So, um, and that could be a, a decent proportion of our country. Um, for most people though, you know, they would be having some good food, you know, the occasional bit of fiber, in their diet, which means the microbes are hanging on and they're easier to then stimulate when you, you feed them up uh, and, you, and you give them more greens. So, um, you know, I think he has improved, but he's still, uh, you know, below average, but I, I'm working on it. Okay, great. Tim, I think we'll have to finish there. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank you once again for a really outstanding uh, presentation this evening uh, the, the, in terms of its uh, breadth and uh, uh, the fascinating insights that you've uh, been able to provide to us this evening. I'm sure it's given us uh, uh, a lot of food for thought. Great. Um, My pleasure. Um, just to uh, remind our audience that we will be uh, in touch shortly to capture some feedback for you. So you should get a link to Mentimeter uh, in the next few minutes. And just to remind everyone that our um, final lecture of this year's series will be on Thursday, the 21st of March, when we have Dr. Natalie Joseph Williams from Cardiff University talking on how research is critical to improving health and social care services in Wales. So, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, sorry we didn't uh, get to all your questions this evening, but... Um, uh, many thanks again for the excellent questions that uh, we did, uh, that Tim did address. So, hey, take care now. See you in a few weeks' time. No start.